third John. No, the bell's going to ring. But third John, I know, I know you're thinking we're almost through. <laughs> we're down to number three. All right, third John, verse one, and then I think I'm suspecting this will be all we'll get to, and then we'll we'll finish third John, uh, Lord willing, next week, and then we'll begin the week after that, archaeology in the Bible. Okay, I know I've kind of messed up the stuff. So if you know anybody, I've had a couple of people say they want to hear archaeology in the Bible. They didn't care anything about 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. I just threw that in there. Uh, but they wanted to hear archaeology in the Bible. So if you know somebody like that, I sent out a note, but sometimes the notes you send out, they get buried in all the other things that are said in the emails. So the 17th, not next week, I finish 3rd John next week, Lord willing, and then the next week after that, begin archaeology in the Bible. So if you know anybody who's looking forward to that, tell them. All right, the elder to the beloved Gaius whom I love in truth. Now, 3 John's written by the Apostle John to a dear friend of his named Gaius. Now, Gaius, it was a common name in the Greco-Roman world of the New Testament era. References made elsewhere in the New Testament to a Gaius who was a Macedonian. You see that in Acts 19.29, a Gaius from the town of Derbe, Acts chapter 20, verse 4, and a Gaius who lived in Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1.14 and Romans 16.23. Now, there's no way to know if the Gaius to whom John is writing in 3 John was one of those Gaiuses <laughs> mentioned elsewhere. You see, because the name's common. It'd be like if it said Steve or John or something like that. Well, you could think, well, you know, the church isn't all that big, and, and it may be. I would not argue against it. But I'm just saying you can't know. You see, it could be a different Gaius but it could be one of these guys here. And he says, John, John loves him in truth. Again, you have this question, does he mean he sincerely or truly loves him? Well, I think it at least means that. But I think it means more than that. I think it means he loves him as one who continues in the truth of Jesus Christ as preached from the beginning. He loves him in the truth. See, Gaius is holding firm to the apostolic doctrine and he's living accordingly. And you've had that experience in your life where you've been with people, you've prayed with them, you've sung with them, and then later you hear that they are living faithfully and just serving the Lord and serving as a deacon, serving as an elder, doing this and that. It's great news. The other side, of course, is you've heard in your life people who you said, well, no, uh, he's fallen away and very hostile towards Jesus. Well, that's just a killer. But that's what he's experiencing here. Heard the bell next week, third John finished, hopefully. Thank you. Uh, okay, third John. Third John 1, we talked about this last week. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. John is writing to his, his dear friend Gaius. And when he says he loves him in the truth, meaning he loves him as one who continues in the truth of Christ, the truth that has been preached from the beginning. Gaius is holding firm to apostolic doctrine, and he's living accordingly. John says I, he loves him in the truth. So they have this tremendous bond. And then he says in verses 2 to 4, Beloved, I pray that you may get along well in everything and be in good health, just as your soul is getting along well. For I rejoiced greatly at the coming of the brothers, and they're testifying to your truth. Namely, how you are walking in the truth. I do not have greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Now, John's affection for Gaius, it's emphasized because he, again here, he calls him beloved in verse 1. He calls him beloved here in verse 2. He'll call him beloved again in verses 5 and 11. So he just, they have a, just a real deep bond. And he prays for God's blessings in Gaius' life generally, in everything. I pray that you may get along well in everything. And he prays for Gaius' physical health. So he has this general prayer for blessing in everything. And he prays specifically for Gaius' physical health. And we readily pray those kinds of prayers, don't we, for people we love? You know, people uh, to whom we feel especially close, right? You think of your spouse, children, family members, 
We regularly pray these kinds of prayers. We ask God to protect them, to bring good things into their lives, and to see them through all circumstances in a way that strengthens and blesses them. You know you pray those kinds of prayers, but you see this is a testimony to this bond that he has with Gaius, that he prays these kinds of prayers for him. And he acknowledges Gaius' faithfulness and Gaius' spiritual health by saying that he's praying that his circumstances, Gaius' circumstances and Gaius' physical health, he's praying that his circumstances and his physical health may go as well as his spiritual life is going. Now, would you want somebody to pray that about you? You see? Well, see, that's good. Because that's a testimony to his spiritual life, right? If you can say, I want, I want your circumstances and your physical health to be like your spiritual life. All right, well, if your spiritual life is healthy and good, well, then you'd want that. If you're worried about your spiritual life, you wouldn't want somebody praying that your physical life be like your spiritual life. You'd be going, don't do that. But you see, this is a, this is a, a, a he acknowledges his faithfulness and his spiritual health in that prayer. And then he, he immediately explains how he knows that Gaius is doing so well spiritually. See, this is before uh, Skype and cell phones and all that. I mean, how do you know? They've been apart for I don't know how long. And there's, you know, not this easy communication. So he explains immediately how he knows he's doing so well spiritually. He knows because some brothers had visited him and had testified to the truth about Gaius, which is that he is walking in the truth. So he had some brothers come and fill him in on how Gaius is doing. They testified to the truth about Gaius, and that truth was that Gaius is walking in the truth. As I've said before, walking in the truth, this is this idea of living in light of the truth that Jesus is Lord. It is living your life surrendered to the Lord Jesus, walking that way. Gaius is abiding in the gospel of Christ, and he's living the implication of that faith. He's not simply believing certain things. He's surrendered to certain things. He doesn't just know things. He's entrusted himself to those things. So that's, he's walking that way. He's living consistently with the truth that he professes. That is how all Christians are to be. If we put this in terms of Paul's words in Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Gaius was conducting himself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, we kind of balk at that. We, no, no, no I, nobody is worthy of the gospel of Christ. In the sense, Paul means we need to be. Right? Because he tells the Philippians, this is how you're to live. So you have to recognize there is a sense of faithfulness. There is a sense of general submission and a course of life that can fairly be characterized as walking and living this way and living in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. That's what he's saying about Gaius. These guys reported Gaius is walking in the truth. And so he's happy about that. John says he rejoiced greatly over the news. I mean, he's not just rejoicing. He's rejoicing greatly over the news. And it was no doubt especially sweet to hear this because of the threats to faith that were circulating in John's area. Right? He's concerned about these things. So here's this beloved brother that I don't know how long it had been since he'd heard about him. And you know how you'd be concerned I wonder, you know, what kind of toll are these people taking? Who are they bagging? And then here come the brothers, and they say, you man, Gaius. You know, he's, he's doing great. Gaius is walking. So, you know, this, the, the greatness of his rejoicing is probably tied to that. You see, then as now, there are forces at work. There are always forces at work seeking to pull believers from the truth, seeking to lure them into abandoning what they once believed. So it's such a great thing to hear, right? It's a great thing to hear that some beloved brother or sister from your past is keeping on, keeping on, as we'd say in the day. You know, they're keeping on, keeping on. They're being faithful. They're staying with it. 
they're resisting all of these things that are trying to pull them and saying, no, that's not right over here. You know, no, 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 that's not Jesus. It's over here. It's over here. All of this stuff, always working to pull people. And it doesn't, shouldn't surprise us, right? I mean, this is how the enemy would work. He, he, he has many tools. And one of the tools he employs is this idea of trying to pull Christians away from apostolic doctrine. And there you see it. So here he says the word Gaius, is, that's not working with him. And that joy is multiplied. You know, the joy you have when you hear that somebody, some dear brother or sister, somebody reports to you that they're keeping on, keeping on, that joy is multiplied. When it's somebody that you had a hand in leading to Christ, or somebody with whom you had a special relationship in terms of their spiritual welfare, someone you relate to as your spiritual child. I mean, that's what, that's what it, it is even more important. You've had, you know, people you've studied with, people you may have led to Christ, or people you nurtured who were young Christians. When you hear down the road that those brothers and sisters are really doing great, it's just like wonderful. It's so wonderful to hear that they are flourishing and growing, and that's what John's experiencing. When John hears this, hears this about Gaius, John says he has no greater joy than to receive this kind of news. That's pretty, that's pretty impressive, isn't it? He has no greater joy than to hear that somebody with whom he relates this way, somebody he can call his spiritual child, that they are keeping on keeping on. It just thrills his soul. And implicit in this is John's desire for Gaius to continue to give him joy by continuing to walk in the truth regarding the request that John's about to make. You see, this is implicit in here, is that he longs, you just, you know, you're filling my heart. I'm just loving this. And of course, I want you to continue doing that when you hear what I'm going to ask of you. You see, that's implicit. That he says in verses 5 through 8, <clears throat> Beloved, you act faithfully in whatever you do for the brothers, even though they are strangers. They testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the pagans. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be co-workers in the truth. John, he praises Gaius for having on previous occasions shown hospitality to missionaries from John's community, those within John's sphere, his geographical area, his orbit. So he praises him for having previously shown hospitality to such missionaries, even though they were strangers. They were people unknown to Gaius. He took them in. And this is more significant in the ancient Mediterranean world than you may realize, because in that world, extending hospitality to somebody meant more than simply providing food and housing for them. It also meant becoming a guarantor of the visitor to the rest of the community. When you received them and you welcomed and accepted them, you were basically vouching for them to the rest of the community. See, it wasn't like today nobody knows who's where anywhere. When somebody comes in and you take them in, you're saying to the rest of the community, they're okay, and I'm vouching for them. Well, you can see how that puts at risk your own reputation, your own standing in that community. Because if this guy comes in and he starts cheating people out of stuff, or he starts pilfering, or he starts conducting himself in any kind of way that is not noble or right, well, you're the one. You brought him in. You said he was okay. And so you opened us up to him. So it carried that sense and that risk, and that's why letters of recommendation were so important. You read about the letters of recommendation. What's that about? Again, you know, you couldn't just call somebody. So here come people traveling around, and these letters of recommendation were very important. And this kind of hospitality, 
It was just crucial to the spread of the gospel. This hospitality was crucial. Inns, they were unpleasant and dangerous places. They were not the kind of place anybody would want to go, so Christians depended on the hospitality of fellow Christians as they went about preaching the gospel. This was the network. This was what fed Christians as they went and spread out. It was that network of hospitality that allowed them to go and preach and, and to extend out. So it was very, very important that, that this was done. Now, the prior recipients of Gaius's hospitality, people he had received before this, they testified to it, he says, before the church, which may suggest that it was done in a congregational assembly. And I want you to see that the act of showing hospitality to the missionaries, it's described as Gaius's love. See, I don't know if we would use it that way. Would we call that love? You know, we call it hospitality. But that's what I want you to see, this idea of love. It has such a deeper dimension to it than simply a feeling about somebody. It is this commitment to somebody. And so you see it there that his showing hospitality, his putting his own name on the line, his putting his goods on the line to bless those people, that is love. That's the love John talks about. Love with skin on it, not simply an emotion, but an investment in people, doing for people, sacrificing for the benefit, blessing, and welfare of other people. That's what love is. And so he refers to this, you see, as love. In doing that for them, he had loved them. He had loved them. He had risked and sacrificed for them. Now, the second part of, of verse 6. So here you have these prior missionaries to whom Gaius had shown hospitality. They had come back and testified to that before the church. They had told everybody about how well Gaius had treated them. And in the second half, the focus shifts from praising Gaius for his past hospitality, the past hospitality he had shown, to the brothers to requesting that he continue in that same vein by showing hospitality to the stranger Demetrius, who you see in verse 12. So it shifts that he will show that same hospitality to Demetrius and whoever may be accompanying Demetrius, who had now arrived at Gaius's place with this letter, 3 John. So he says, the guys you've helped before, they've told us all about it. Now, I want you to go ahead and continue in that same vein with regard to the new batch of guys, Demetrius and whoever is with him. And that shift in focus, you can see it, it's marked by the change to the future tense where he says, first he's saying they testified to it here. Then he says, you will do well to send them on their way. You see, so there's this, there's this change, and he's talking about the people who have now come with Demetrius. And that expression, to send them on their way, that expression uses a verb that functioned in the early church as a technical term for missionary support. It was missionary support. You can see that in Acts 15, 3, Romans 15, 24, 1 Corinthians 16, 6, 16, 11. 2 Corinthians 1.16 and Titus 3.13. So when he's talking about this, to send them on their way, it's this notion of being uh, their sponsor, not the right word, you know, somebody who wrapped up in this hospitality is sending them out on their mission. It is a missionary sense and a missionary term, and John requests that he do so. In fact, when he says, you will do well, that's, all, that's an idiom almost equivalent to our pleas. Okay, but he requests that he does so, but he requests that he does so in a manner worthy of God. That's pretty heavy. I want you to go ahead and send them out as missionaries, but I want you to do it in a manner worthy of God. This means in a way that God would approve. 
Do it in a way God would approve. Do it in a way that respects and validates the dedication of these brothers to the cause of Christ. That you do it in that way. You don't do it sitting here saying, oh man, do we have to do this? Do we have to give something? What's the least we can give them? What? Do it in a way, in a manner worthy of God. You see, that shows and reinforces that what these guys are doing is tremendously important that they are going about telling people about God's work in Christ. He explains in verse 7 that they should be supported that way, sent out as missionaries in a manner worthy of God, in a way that God, of which, in a way he would approve. They should be supported that way because they went out for the sake of the name. They went out for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ to preach his name. To tell people the truth about who Jesus is and to bring people to faith. They are literally out there in the first century telling the news of what God has done in bringing Jesus. So they're going out spreading this news and going telling people. And so this is something that's very, very important. So because of what they're doing, because of the nobility of their task, because of their submission and love for Christ, their service of Him, because of that, you should send them, out, send them out in a way worthy of God. You see, in a way worthy of God. They had no, in doing that, they had no help from pagans. What are the pagans going to do? You think they're going to be supporting them, giving them anything? Saying, sure, here, come, we'll, be, we'll put you up and vouch for you and risk that and send you out and support you as you go out and give you what you need and give you letters of recommendation to our next friend in the chain and all that. They're not going to do that. They receive squat from them. So he says that they received no help from the pagans and non-Christians, so they were completely dependent on the body of Christ, on the Christian community. And you can see also how that what that that builds the bond. You see that we see that we're different. We're all people. I understand that. We're all members of a society and a culture. I understand that. But there's something about the saints. There's a bond. You see, and the more we reinforce that, I think the better it is for the life of the church. You see, they were dependent on the Christian community. They were dependent on people like Gaius for hospitality. Completely dependent on that. Now, John is describing who these brothers are who've arrived at Gaius's door. That's what he's saying here. What he's saying, he's, he's describing who they are. These people have gone out for the name. They're noble. They're worthy. And you need to help them. You need to support them. You need to continue in the same vein as you had done before. Now, given the greatness of the work, in which these men are engaging, the fact they are out telling people the good news of Jesus, he says in verse 9, that we as Christians ought to support them. We ought to support them. We ought to provide the necessary hospitality for them so that we may be co-workers with them in the truth of Christ. That's important. I like that. You know, because sometimes you think about, well, what can I do to serve God? How can I be a worker for God? Well, here's one way. And it's right out of the scripture. It is one way that we can be co-workers with them in the truth of Christ. You see, just as providing hospitality to a heretic makes one a sharer in that heretic's work, as he said in 2 John verse 11, so providing hospitality to faith, faithful missionaries makes one a sharer in that glorious work. You are a part of that work. As you show them hospitality and you send them on their way, you support them in their missionary endeavor. You are sharers with them in that glorious work. So we have to feel that. We have to understand that. When we support and help missionaries, people who are out teaching people about Jesus, this is what we're doing. We're sharing in that work. And it's just a shame to me sometimes how hard missionaries have to work. You have people who are faithful, devoted, 
willing to go to places that you'd have to shoot me to get me there. And they're willing to go there and live that way and proclaim the name of Jesus. And then they have to go and beg every quarter or every six months or every year and go around all the churches and say, well, you, well, you know, we've had a problem. Can't support you anymore. But we can do all this other junk. You see, it's, I mean, I don't know the level, current level of missionary giving in the church. I don't know. But it's never been stellar in my judgment. It's always seemed to be a thing. Now, I think we, ha we have to be responsible. We have to recognize who is the person. But I'm telling you, there are plenty of faithful, devout, real deal people who will go and preach the gospel in places that I would not go. And so here they are. And we have a responsibility as the body of Christ to support them. That's what I see John saying. Now, he's speaking, of course, in the first instance to his context. But then what's God saying to us through what John said to Gaius? And the message I get is he's saying that we need to be people who are willing to help and support missionaries and those who will go and tell the gospel to other people. And that's part of, part of how we share in the work. That's not just talk. That's not just elders trying to get you to get on board with something. That's the truth. You do, in fact, share in their work. In doing that. So we ought to be about that and sharing in that Christ honoring work. He says in verses 9 and 10 I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be the boss among them, does not pay attention to us. So if I come, I will bring up what he's doing, spreading evil words against us. And not being content with those things, he also does not welcome the brothers and forbids those who want to do so, and puts them out of the church. Now John had written earlier, it seems. He had written earlier to a, Christ, to a church near the Christian community to which Gaius belonged. So he'd written earlier to a church near the community to which Gaius belonged, and in that congregation there was a man named Diotrephes, who apparently had some sort of leadership role in that group, in that church to which John had written. And he rejected John's authority. I mean, that sounds to us like crazy. But he did. He rejected John's authority, refusing to pay attention to what John had written. So here's John, the apostle. He writes something to somebody, and this guy blows it off. He says, I'm not going to heed that. I'm not going to pay attention to that. Well, maybe he was a casualty of the theological confusion that had been sown by the false teachers in this setting. Maybe they had taken him. Maybe they had convinced him that they were really the enlightened ones. And John was the one who didn't know what he was talking about. But the reason why he rejects John's testimony and rejects John's authority, it's not specified. But clearly he writes to this church and we've got this fellow who's rejecting his authority, who's refusing to pay attention to what John had written. And to make matters worse, when missionaries from John's community, the same kind of people that Gaius had welcomed so effectively, when missionaries from John's community when they had showed up, they'd sought hospitality at Diotrephes' congregation. Diotrephes treated them like heretics. He treated the missionaries from the orthodox, faithful, apostolic group. He treated them as heretics. See, the fact, that, the fact they were no doubt accompanied by a letter similar to 3 John when they showed up there, just as Demetrius is showing up with 3 John, the fact they no doubt had been accompanied by the same kind of letter, that didn't matter. Because Diotrephes didn't accept John as a reliable source of testimony, so what's he care about his letter? So you've got Christian missionaries, faithful brothers, they're coming, they come to this congregation where Diotrephes is, they no doubt have a letter from John, and he says, buzz off. 
buzz off. He treats them like heretics. He not only refused to welcome the missionaries himself, but said, I'm not having anything to do with you. I'm not going to help you. He also forbid anybody else from doing that. He wouldn't let anybody else welcome them and take them in and receive them. And he even put out of the church those who wanted to do so. Those who wanted to help the missionaries who had come from John. He's not helping them. And he's given the boot to anybody who wants to, to presumably claiming that in doing that, they thereby were offering support to heresy. See, presumably that's what he's doing. He says, listen, I'm putting you out of the church for wanting to provide support for John's missionaries because in doing that, you are lending aid and comfort to heretics. So it looks like Diotrephes was doing to the true and the faithful Christians what John had instructed the Christians in 2 John to do to heretics. He was treating the faithful as heretics. But this isn't a case, you see, of what's good for the goose is good for the gander, as we might think about it. This isn't a situation in which every claim is as good and as valid as every other. You see, that's not how it works. There is a truth, as shocking as that may be in our postmodern world. There is a truth. And the fact of the matter is that John is standing with God and Diotrephes is not. That's the fact. So that in his treating the faithful orthodox as heretics, he's doing something shameful. Whereas Christians treating heretics as heretics, they're complying with what John has said. You see, the truth matters. Who's on the right side matters. Especially when you're talking about matters of heresy and things that are so fundamental. You see, that's important. There is a truth. And the fact of the matter, as I say, is that John's with God and Diotrephes isn't. So John is a courageous champion of truth. That's, what, that's who he is. He's a courageous champion of truth, whereas Diotrephes is an arrogant or a confused churchman with delusions of apostolic grandeur. So he's in the wrong. He's way off theologically, whether influenced by these teachers or not. And yet, how does he see himself? Well, this is how people in such error often are. You can't penetrate them. You can't get through to them. They're going to tell you that you're the heretic. And that's what seems to be happening here. Now, we sometimes analogize, you know, a bossy elder or a preacher or a church member to Diotrephes, but that's fair only to a point. Okay, that's fair only to a point. Yes, Diotrephes, he loved to be first, or as I translated it, he loved to be the boss. But the real problem with Diotrephes was that his bossy spirit was employed in a rejection of apostolic authority. It wasn't simply his bossy spirit that he liked to have his way or something like that. It's that that spirit was employed in the rejection of apostolic authority. He opposed the truth of God. See, no doubt thinking that he wasn't, and he tried to rally people to his erroneous viewpoint by slandering John, and he imposed his error on the people he failed to persuade. He said, if you won't go agree with me and accept us and you want to show hospitality to these missionaries from John, I'm kicking you out of the church. So by force, he imposed his error on those people. So it's a bigger problem, and it's a deeper problem simply than insisting on his own way. Okay, and I think that's a distinction that, that bears keeping in mind. Truth can't be taken out of the analysis. All right, and that's the point, as I say, that in our world, our postmodern world, people, of course, if I get started on that, any of these postmodern people, they are self-defeating in about three seconds, okay? They wind up jumping on you. I say, you jumping on me? Why? Why are you jumping on me? You think I'm doing something wrong? So you've got a special set of things that, that are okay. You can judge on those, but it's only my truth that you don't like. Anyway, you know that. All right, John says that if he comes... He says if he comes, he will confront Diotrephes about his trashing of him. 
and those who are faithful to the gospel that John preaches. He says, if I come, I'm going to confront him about this stuff. You see, he says that. See, love speaks the truth. And John is not willing to remain silent in the service of this false notion that confronting people is unloving. That the only way you can love people is ignore them and not call them out of their error. Not call them out of their sin. This is such nonsense. So we want to say that we're loving people because we leave them in their sin and won't tell them. What you're doing is immoral and sinful, and it will damn you. Well, that's not loving. That's being hate. So it's just beautiful watching how the enemy works, you see. He just reverses everything. So now you, have mo you take a poll among most people, and telling somebody the truth that would bless them, most people in our society, depending on what that truth is, they would say that's hate. Well, who's, who's behind that, you think? Yeah, I know who's behind it, but that's how that works. He says in verses 11 and 12, Beloved, do not imitate the evil but the good. The one who does good is from God. The one who does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has been favorably testified to by everyone, even by the truth itself. And we also testify. And you know that our testimony is true. John warns his dear friend Gaius here. He warns him not to imitate the evil being done by Diotrephes, but rather to imitate the good, which in this context, it probably refers to his continuing to be John's ally and continuing to welcome those John sends, specifically to welcome Demetrius, who's bringing the letter. So when he sits here and he tells him, don't imitate the evil that is so present in Diotrephes, but rather the good. You continue to do as you have been doing. Now perhaps John's concerned, maybe he's concerned that Gaius might go wobbly. See, under the force of Demetrius' influence and personality, I don't know who this guy is. You know, there are a lot of people who are pretty persuasive and they, you know, uh, blowhards. And so maybe this guy's one of them. And maybe John is wanting to make sure, hey, you know, you don't put up with this and you stand your ground here. Now, doing good is a character trait of those who are born of God. It's a character trait. It flows from that relationship. And conversely, the one who does evil has not seen God, by which he means he has no knowledge, awareness, or understanding of God. How could you if you're doing evil? He's the, he's the exact opposite of that. So that's what he's talking about there. And this is a not-so-veiled reference to Diotrephes, who probably rejects, he re rejects John's authority in God's name when he, in truth, is clueless about God. You see, he's probably holding himself up as the one who's really enlightened, really tuned in, whereas the fact of the matter is, he, he has no idea about God. So I suspect that's what's lurking here in John's phrasing. Now, this puts the stakes in John's appeal on a different level. Right? This kind of raises the stakes. More is involved than simply refusing hospitality. Hosp his, his giving hospitality to Demetrius and those with him in this context, it is, has much larger meaning. You see, when you've got this guy over here who's challenging the authority, you've already welcomed people before. We now have this guy over here making noise, threatening, and all this stuff. I want you to continue. I don't want you to be intimidated by this guy. I want you to do for these brothers as you have done for others, regardless of this guy. You continue to do that. In verse 12, John, he introduces and he recommends Demetrius who's almost, as I say, Demetrius is almost certainly the one carrying 3 John. And so John here, he recommends and introduces him, and he says that everybody speaks well of Demetrius. Well, that's pretty good, right? I mean, that, that's, that's a good thing. You know, you don't live for that, and that's not, but it's good that people will testify. When you have unanimous testimony that he's a good guy. You know, I know him. I know his character. You know, he's a straight shooter, true disciple, somebody who lives 
to serve the Lord Jesus. Well, that's good. You know, that's about the best thing you can say about somebody, I think. You know, the highest compliment you can give somebody is to say that they're a faithful disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what people are saying here about him. Everybody speaks well of Demetrius, and he adds that he's spoken well of even by the truth itself. He's spoken well of even by the truth itself. Now, that probably means that the truth of the gospel, see, both its propositions and its ethical implications, that they speak favorably of Demetrius by virtue of his conformity to it. You see, so when he sits here and he says that, 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 that spoken well of even by the truth itself, what I think he's saying is that, look, the truth of the gospel, its revelation, its propositions, and its ethical implications, that truth vouches for Demetrius objectively by virtue of his holding to the propositions and living the ethical implications. So he is faithful in terms of content and ethical walking in the light, you see, in terms of the life that he lives. In other words, that, that objective truth, that truth stands as a witness to the kind of man he is. So you have everybody testifying about him, and you have the truth itself objectively testifying about him through his conformity to it. And so it doesn't get much better than that. But John adds to that commendation that he and those in his immediate circle, that they also vouch for Demetrius' commitment and character. So you got everybody, you got the truth itself, and you got John and his group. They're all saying, the guy's great. All right, well, that's what you want, right? I mean, that's what you want a missionary. You want somebody coming to you where everybody, you want to go over here and have a pocket of people saying, I don't know, he was involved with us, and, you know, he did this, and there was a question about what he was watching on his computer, and blah, blah. You don't want any of that. You see, you want somebody to come to you and say, this, this guy's rock solid, and you like it from all different quarters, because then your heart's delighted, you see, to help. To just say, yeah, how can we help you? Thank you for going out and teaching people about Jesus. You see, and so that's the kind of person you have here in Demetrius. And, and regarding their, their testimony of John and his group, he says, Gaius knows that they speak the truth. You see, Gaius knows John. So John can just say to him, you know me, right? All right, so when I'm telling you something, uh, you know that I'm telling you the truth, right? And Gaius' dear friend would go, yeah, I can't, I can't deny that. I know the kind of person that you are. Then he finishes here, verses 13 and 14. I had many things to write to you, but I do not want to write to you by means of ink and pen. Rather, I hope to see you very soon and we'll speak face to face. Peace to you. The friends here greet you. Greet the friends there by name. John, he hopes to visit Gaius soon, but that will depend, of course, on whether Gaius remains loyal and receives Demetrius and whoever else may be with Demetrius. John expects that. He loves him. Everything he's heard about Gaius is that he's walking in the truth, how he's treated people before, but you got this wild card of Diotrephes out here, you know, causing a stink. So he says that, you know, if he winds up coming here, he hopes to visit soon. That may be why he says in verse 10, he says, if I come. You see, that, that may be, there may be this idea that he's saying, of course, if you wind up being swamped by this guy and you reject my missionaries, well, then, you know, we're going to have to reassess. But his expectation is, I'm going to come soon and see you face to face, my dear, wonderful brother because you will have received Demetrius and treated him the way you've treated the others. And so that's what I think he's about. And the friends of Gaius who are there with John, so John is here writing to Gaius, but Gaius has pals, buddies, brothers and sisters here. He's known. So those friends, they send greetings to him. It's a shout out. You see, he's saying, hey, you know, all the, all the folks here that you know here, they all wanted me to be sure. Like you say, somebody, hey, say hey for me. Right, that's what they're saying. 
I say, hey, well, you know, just, just tell him I said, hey, you know, I'm thinking about him, praying about him. Uh, he's on my heart and I love him. All right, so that's what's happening. So he's there doing that, and John asked Gaius to pass on his greetings to John's friends who were near Gaius. So he passes on greetings from Gaius' friends who are near John, and he says, hey, you give the shout out to my friends who are near you. And you see this sense of community. It's just exciting to me to see, you know, to feel the first century church like that. So they, they clearly have a number of mutual friends, which you would expect in the Christian community, right? And you might have, I heard that bell, you might, have, you might have experienced that. Like sometimes you'll go somewhere and it's like, oh, you know, so-and-so, oh yeah, down there, yeah, yeah. We were in Colorado one time and we went to, I can't remember if Meg was here, she'd know the name of the place. But we're out someplace with a listener family staying somewhere. We went to this little church on Sunday and sitting right in front of us were the people who visit here a lot of times. <laughs> I'm thinking, whoo, that's crazy. All right. Thanks for coming. Next week, Archaeology Bible, Lord willing, if you know anybody that cares about that, tell them. And if you're just really bored this evening and wanting something to do, come to church tonight here.